right, hello, and Chatelet buckos, <coughs> and welcome to Polecat Cast number 128, Comics Gate, where our stealthy polecats ferret out the best feels, funnies, and what the fucks to discuss Slam Bam Badger style. Mind your spines for the cringe, hold on to your sides for the lulls, and keep your chemo at the ready for this cancer. Today's polecat panel consists of the polecat punster and pussycat punisher Hannah. Dr. Random Cam, Britain, Panda, Puppet Master, and Rabid Long Range Retortician. Me, the Supreme Doge in charge with my trusty Doge whistle so that I can transmit my suspected white supremacist messages to the secret patriarchal network. And I am joined by the special guest, Captain Cummings, supervillain of the internet. Today we will be discussing the following topics. Men's sheds are a good way for men to get together build and create all while bonding and perhaps even work through more than just simple mechanical obstacles now women are joining in and suddenly it's a cause to celebrate according to the media what do you guys think about this and what do we think about this friend and anti-social justice content creator theron meyer has joined many other wrong thinkers such as sargon of akkad and milo yiannopoulos in the twitter gulag after a heated exchange on social media got her perma banned. A man in New Zealand set himself on fire outside the parliament building. Where have we seen this before? Marlene Schiappa, France's new gender equality minister, don't know why we have one of those, but okay, set up a working group of five lawmakers in an attempt to determine the legal definition for street harassment, the goal being to punish men who do crazy things like talk to women ask for phone numbers, and make eye contact. Comicsgate has been a thing brewing under the surface of this current culture war, and I think it's high time we finally acknowledge it. Now, before we get on to the first story, I want to do the shill. Today's shill is the Crisis in Men's Mental Health Town Hall event. It features Dr. Benjamin Rosen, this Wednesday, that's tomorrow, September 25th at 7 p.m. in Lash Miller Chemical Labs, room 161 at the University of Toronto. That's on 80 St. George Street in Toronto, Canada. The event will be hosted by U of T Men's Issue Society, sponsored by CAFE. Musician Chester Bennington, comedian Robin Williams, actor Jonathan Brandis. And it's not just celebrities. We're regularly confronted by the tragic suicide deaths of men including young and university-aged men. In fact, each year, about 4,000 people die by suicide in Canada alone. Three out of those 4,000, 3,000 that is, are men. Following a short report on the state of mental, men's mental health, we will hold a conversation around the barriers men's fed, me, me, sorry, uh, we will hold a conversation around the barriers that men face in accessing mental health care and how these can be addressed. Benjamin Rosen, the guy who's hosting the event, is a psychiatrist specializing in men's mental health at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. Benjamin received his MD at McMaster University, his MSc at the London School of Economics, and he completed residency training at the University of Toronto. Benjamin is collaborating with another psychiatrist, Dr. Andrew Howlett, to build Canada's first academic men's mental health program. Benjamin's research interests relate to father's mental health and increasing access to psychological services for men. Benjamin is a co-founder of the Father's Mental Health Network, a network of clinicians, researchers, educators, and fathers that aims to generate knowledge, research, and solutions that support men in their role as fathers. He also works in the Murray Koffler Urology Program, treating men with mental health issues related to infertility, sexual dysfunction, and chronic pain. There is a link to all this stuff in the low bar as well as in the show notes. So without further ado, let us get into the stories. But before we do, I want to thank you guys for joining us on the live stream. Those of you who are joining us from Twitch, uh, Periscope, um, Facebook, YouTube, whatever we have. I have the chat displaying all of the various um, streaming services that we're using. And I am paying attention to the chat as well. So please feel free to participate in the conversation. All right. So first story. Well, actually, before we even get into the first story, I have breaking news. Breaking news. It just happened or re really recently. You may remember a story 
from, I don't know, a couple weeks ago, Lavinia Woodward. There was an Oxford student who stabbed her boyfriend and the judge said, oh, you know, we think that she might be too bright and has too promising a future to put in prison or to actually penalize her. Well, as it turns out, the Oxford medical student that was seen too bright to be given a prison sentence has been allowed to walk free from court, despite the judge acknowledging that she broke her bail conditions. Latvinia Woodward, 24, who stabbed her Cambridge University boyfriend in the leg with a breading, bread knife, was spared jail yesterday as she was commended for her strong and unwavering determination to address her drug addiction. She left the courtroom. Woodward has been seen mouthing the words, thank you to the judge as she was ushered out of the dock in tears by her family. The decision last night was, uh, was last night criticized by criminal justice campaigners who said that the lenient ruling would deter men who had fallen victim to domestic abuse from coming forward. It comes four months after Judge Ian Pringle QC described Woodward, an aspiring heart surgeon, as an extraordinarily able young lady whose talents meant that a prison sentence would be too severe. While standing trial in May, Woodward pleaded guilty to unlawful wounding after she punched and stabbed Cambridge student Thomas Fairclough whilst under the influence of alcohol and drugs. So... I just thought I would put that out there. Uh, I think someone is chomping at the bit to say something. So I will yeah, I got I got one thing to say about this. Just compare this just for a second uh, to the way feminists responded to uh, the the judge who believed Brock Turner's side of the story when he said he obtained consent before beginning the the sexual interaction with a girl that he was eventually convicted of sexual assault uh, for for failing to stop when she passed out. Um, and that's that's the basic story on that. And feminists went nuts over that. And and there were people that showed up in his neighborhood, which is in the Dayton metro area, um, in his neighborhood with guns that would shoot through brick, brick and mortar. And they bombarded, apparently, the state with uh, requests that this judge be be uh, disbarred, that he his his uh, his job be taken away and so on. I'll bet not one feminist writes to Oxford to suggest that this woman's degree, if she has a degree, be rescinded or that she get kicked out of school if she's still in school, um, which they would do if the sexes were reversed. And it's, it's very telling that there has not been one peep out of all of the various feminist groups that get together and protest when a new story like this hits the front pages and the victim is a woman and the perpetrator is a man. It's very telling. They very much do not care about men. When feminists come out and tell you that feminism fights for men's rights, remember this story and the complete and utter lack of feminist response to it. Yep. Uh, I, I mean, I have not, not much else to add. Uh, Joey Jojo gave us $5 and writes, we should do the same for her. Equality, am I right? Well. This is why they never found Jack the Ripper. Because he was a woman. <laughs> and whenever a woman gets convicted of shit like this, we go, oh, she's such a talented surgeon. Let's let her carry on butchering people. Off you go. Where <laughs> is that Jack? Where's Jack the Ripper? Jackie the Ripper. <laughs> such a talented murderer. I mean, it would be such a waste. Yeah. So does that does that mean we don't know Jack about serial killing? No, we don't. <laughs> All right, so I guess uh, we'll actually get into the stories, but um, I will. There, there's also uh, feel free to share this one about Lavinia. She has like this weird villainous name, Lavinia Woodward, and her uh, egregious stabbing, wounding, whatever it is. So yeah, feel feel free to share that. So moving she on, much, she looks much more sinister, like coming out of court, d dressed up like that, than she did in that shot where she stood in the swamp in her pants. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> there's something very very psychoy about her face. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm reading too much into things. Perhaps. All right. So first story, men sheds. So this one was written by Max Darrett. He puts a bit of different spin on it. I appreciate his positivity, but I think there's something more to it. So I'm going to go ahead and read Max's thing. I think we can all agree that sometimes when everything seems so chaotic, what we can all really do with 
is a light, simple human story that shows that there is still some sanity in the world. In my opinion, this story about women becoming welders just does just that. In a story on abc.net.au, there's an article titled Men's Shed Opening Their Doors for Women to Learn Welding Skills. The article is about a group of women who attend a welding class once a week. In it, they demonstrate their joy in building able, being able to weld orchid baskets, garden art, or just being able to build something to place in their own home. And what's best is that nowhere in the article does it seem that either the author or the women involved are trying to push any agenda. A boiler maker named Prue Peterson is the owner of this quote unquote men's shed. And she was more than happy to let these women take some time to learn this valuable skill. Prue Peterson offered the following quote to ABC. Quote, these women that are here are learning valuable skills that they can use in their own daily lives, whether it be fixing something in their yard or building something in their own home. They can do these things for themselves. End quote. It's a nice story that put a smile on my face, and I commend these women for going out, trying something new, as well as something that is gender atypical. So, I mean, like, it doesn't really sound like there's anything that you could take issue with here. And, I mean, overall, I don't much. However, I thought, and maybe this is, this is where I'm, I could be wrong here, but I thought that the men's sheds thing was something that was put together specifically for men so that they can... Um, uh, essentially work on themselves or uh, work with each other or something like that. Am I wrong about that? No, I thought that's what I had read about it too, that it's, it's uh, supposed to be a men's space that's, that's not uh, taken over by women. Um, and it's, I'm kind of ambivalent about this because it, I, I know that, that this is something that, that they're doing because they want to do it. So, I mean, that's men's choice. If men want to let women into their spaces, that's their choice. Um, it's not, it's not for anybody else to say, no, you can't do this. Uh, but I certainly hope that these women appreciate what these men are doing for them. Um, and I, I certainly hope that they, they are not the type that goes into a men's space and, and likes how great the environment is and what, what great things happen in there and uh, all the people that they're hanging out with and then decide that the first thing they need to do is demand that the entire thing need to be changed to suit their sensibilities. Uh, and it sounds like they're not doing that so far. And as long as they continue to not do that, then, you know, then, then these men aren't doing themselves any harm, honestly, by, by having women in there. It's just... It, it strikes me that it's opening the door for that to happen. And uh, I, I think I would caution any group of men that have a men's shed that before they do something like this, they might consider the idea of having, you know, limiting it to a day, a particular day, like this one has limited it to a particular day, it looks like, and limiting it to uh, particular areas. And, uh, you know, not all the men have to participate if they don't want to on that day. And, and making it understood in no uncertain terms that it is not the women's prerogative to come in and change things about the, the environment there. That this is a, a men's space and if the women don't like it there, they are free to leave. And that's it. That's, that, that would be my only caution with it. Um, because you, you do end up losing uh, pretty much control over men's spaces pretty quickly when you start letting women in and letting women um, ask for concessions, basically, based on their, uh, based on their sensibilities that, uh, that are associated with their sex. Yeah. Uh, Joey Jojo gives us $5 and says these women are going to destroy it from the inside out, like comics, video games, tabletop games, and everything else that women touch. Um, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use those words. I would say that there are plenty of women that usually have no problem getting involved with uh, a space or a hobby and not trying to change things. It's not, it's not that that's usually the issues. It's usually the more sort of, uh, the types of people who get involved with something, not because they actually like it, but because they think that it's gonna to give them some kind of um, social currency later on down the line, or they, they feel like they can exploit it in some way. There are people who do that, and they're not just women, men do it too. So it, it really depends, but um, I would say I'm with Hannah on this. As far as I can tell, I'm you know relatively indifferent towards it. 
I, I think that uh, guys should keep their eyes on it, though, because if it, it could start happening, and not just with women, but with men, too, because if, you know, if women get involved and some of them express, like, you know, that they want to see some changes, then the white knights are going to come, and then you're going to have problems. So just be aware of that. That's how I would, that's what I would say to that. Uh, okay, so I guess um, we, we have a lot of stories to get to, so I'm going to move on to the next one, unless there's any other thoughts on this. Okay, so I will move on to the next story. Mike? Yes, I, I, was, I was concentrating on the next story. So oh, okay, attention. okay. All right, all right. Next question, Twitter apartheid. Next question, next story, Twitter apartheid. By Mike J. Thanks, Mike. Popular anti-SJW and political commentator Theron Meyer has been banned from Twitter. The transgender YouTube personality suspects the ban could be the result of calling a radical feminist a see you next Tuesday during a heated exchange, but since Twitter has not disclosed the reason for the ban yet, it remains a mystery. This isn't Maya's first suspension. She stated, I've had my Twitter locked before after being harassed and mass reported by Saudi Muslims over a picture of Muhammad. Twitter is the only place I've had these issues so far, end quote. Maya joins the ranks of other prominent right-leaning uh, users to be banned or suspended from the platform, such as Mano Yiannopoulos, Pizza Party Ben, and Martin Shkreli. Okay. And not just that, but also Sargon is not on Twitter and um, there's a couple of other people. And I, would... I think he does have a second uh, account. He just, yeah. he just decided not to bother with it anymore. And why would you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. He did open up a second account. So yeah. this has happened to a number of people. This has also happened to a number of people uh, in the men's rights movement that are not necessarily prominent but um, who, whose uh, commentary is uh, hard-hitting enough or irritating enough to feminists that they decided to, to mass report. And I know, um, for instance, like there's a, a particular account that goes by takes down MRAs that does this, he, that, that, that actually organizes mass reporting publicly, no less, on, on his Twitter account and has been doing so if, by my count, for about two or three years, without repercussions of any kind, he hasn't he hasn't been in trouble for it. He hasn't had any problems with it, and he also organizes flaming of people uh, by by putting uh, people on display in his account and uh, you know sending his followers after them. And this happened with Jack Barnes. Um, he was, he's one that he, he's a kind of a scrapper. So he'll, uh, if you make any kind of a veiled threat against him, he will make an open one back. And that got him in trouble. Uh, but this has happened a lot. Like Judgy Bitch got suspended because they mass reported a picture she made or put up of a cake that she decorated. So she was mass base, mass reported for, for posting cake and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 and banned for posting a cake. But really she was banned for being an anti-feminist and, and uh, moderating the, uh, the, the women against feminist feminism hashtag. So this is, this has been very common. I'm not surprised that it eventually happened to Theron because she's not, She's a uh, trans woman who's off the reservation. She's off the feminist reservation. They don't like that and they don't put up with it. And she doesn't pull any punches when she tells you why she is off the feminist reservation. And that uh, they don't tolerate that. So, yeah. And the thing yeah. is, too, though, that Theron is actually pretty reasonable. I mean, she's... She's not, um, you know, like I, I, this. The, no, she's not rude. The original, she's not rude no, like no, no, no. Not just that, but I mean, like her, <laughs> her, um, you know, the article that talked about this comes from Breitbart. Now, of course, Breitbart is a right-leaning uh, web website. It's a pretty conservative space. So, of course, they're framing this as though it's like targeted against uh, right-wing people, which I think to a degree there's some truth to that. But Theron Meyer is not as right-wing as Breitbart is. She's kind of center, a little bit right, libertarian, but she also, you know, has a lot of very, um, I would say, liberal views as well. So it's not even because Theron is um, all the way off the reservation. She's actually engaged with, you know, social justice warriors online in, in a uh, constructive way. And she likes some of them. You know, she gets along with ContraPoints, for example. 
Um, God, heaven knows why. Yeah, but she doesn't but, buy the victim narrative. But and she that's, doesn't. That's, no, she doesn't. That's, that's an that's unforgivable sin yes. among uh, the social justice types. If you're female, if you're uh, if you're trans, if you're uh, I- anywhere on the multiple letter, whatever it is they're calling it now, spectrum, um, if you are a minority and you don't play the victim game you don't you don't carry the victim narrative with you everywhere you go you are committing a cardinal sin against the church of social justice and they will let you know Mm -hmm. anybody else have a thought oh captain go ahead the thing about twitter that that um weirds me out is they have such ambiguous rules and when uh exactly when you get those mass flat you know you get those that target on your back you know, I had that target on my back, like, and they got me like a week ago, you know, and it's like, I, I understand I made a mistake. <laughs> I was what, drunk. What was your mistake? I, um, I called somebody a homophobic slur and um, they jumped all over me. And then my Twitter account was gone. Like when I woke up the next morning, <laughs> was it? Okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, would you, I guess it depends on whether, cause I, one time I was uh, I was given I think I had like a forty eight hour uh, block period on Facebook, and I swear mm-hmm. to God I was talking to Blair White on Facebook, and I used the word tranny talking to her, okay, who is a tranny, and and uh, Facebook blocked me for forty eight hours. They're like this is offensive, and I was like, but I'm talking to somebody who, well, whatever. So I mean, I, I guess whether or not, and we were joking around with each other because you know, <laughs> Blair does. That, they're gonna you know? end up. They're gonna end up catching mechanics that that work on transmissions in that because they yeah. also are referred to as trainees. The, mm-hmm. the the transmission is referred to as trainee for short. <laughs> and <laughs> they're gonna end up guys talking to each other about their trainee, and they're gonna be like, "Why am I in trouble for saying this? Why am I in trouble for talking about my transmission? Yeah. I don't understand." <laughs> It's, you know, it's, I get, it's funny. I get shadow banned and uh, oh, they uh, throttled and all all kinds of things on Twitter. Every time there's a big event, um, like like the the free speech week that just happened or didn't or whatever happened with it, um, and 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 all of the big events that took place during the election. Every time there's a big event, uh, there are significant changes in the function of my my Twitter account. That, that I'm able to notice. And there are some things that it, it becomes pretty obvious. Um, like, if you are having trouble getting people to respond to your tweets and they're telling you they can't see them in, in threads and so on, and you go look at your analytics, if your analytics won't come up for the, that day or maybe the day before, your shadow banned or your uh, you, you may be getting throttled and there's actually shadow ban checkers that work with some of the algorithms they use for shadow banning. Mm-hmm. But they keep changing what they're doing. So sometimes you'll have uh, you'll have situations where you're you're tweeting and nobody can see it, or it's not seen in in the public areas of uh, of Twitter. Like it's not showing up in hashtags, and you'll have no idea. Um, so they're still doing all that stuff, and uh, it's it's interesting to see them perma banning people because you'd think with all the sneaky stuff they were doing that they would just use that instead. Because uh, then, then, then people don't get the martyr factor. Oh, I've been perma banned for nothing, and which is quite frequently the case. They've been perma banned for nothing, like Judgy and her cake. Um, you know, cake is bad, obviously. Uh, it's also a lie. I'm yeah, sorry. and and a oh, lie. Yeah, that's dead, what it was. The deadest she got, she got meme. It's the deadest banned for meme. lying. Yeah. <laughs> she posted a cake. Uh, but yeah, this is they've been doing this for so long, and and it's nuts because. They they're not stopping conversation. They're just moving it to another platform. This is why people are going to other platforms. So all they're going to end up doing is costing themselves money and yeah. costing themselves users and and hitting their advertisers with a, a lower lower rate of views because people are going to quit using the site. Well, I mean, uh, Twitter is getting to the point now where it's like more bots than people. I think so, but yeah. uh, <laughs> more ads than than actual tweeters so i've still I'll, never been suspended from twitter and never been banned never even been suspended for it as, as far as i know i spend several days away from it sometimes so but i i probably never because i, I rarely tag people i think that's what gets you banned i d- just talk into the wilderness and you'll be although i did tag laurie penny the other day 
but I called her a snot-eating shrew. That didn't get me. Spit. If you call her a cunt, then uh, yeah, that's what the bots set up for. Yeah, yeah. Just use original insults as well. That'll get you around the bots. Just or be, say something original. Tria, yeah, try to it. be creative Getting with your insults. Laurie, though. Laurie just sailed right past me and carried on. Some well, people are easier to troll than others. Yeah, I mean, uh, maybe she can't tweet with her mouth full of boogers. Um, okay, so hey, well, I will. I will say this: um, people <laughs> have told me, "Don't tag people. Don't don't post pictures. Don't do this. Don't do that." From what I've noticed, if you get mass reported because people didn't like what you said, uh, it doesn't matter what you posted. It only matters that the, the staff at Twitter is incompetent and they can't handle when, when people get mass reported. And even if you point out that somebody is directing people to mass report, they don't deal with it. So essentially, I think it has more to do with who you piss off that, uh, that that's a Twitter user than what you post. Uh, I want to follow up. Uh, Theron posted on her Facebook page um, her thoughts, and, and they, they, I'm not doxing her or anything. This is just so her thoughts on what happened. So just so you know where we're at right now. She says, so Twitter got back to me. They won't be unsuspending my account, which sucks, but looking forward, I'm torn. Some say I should come back to Twitter with a new account and play it safer. Others are suggesting I use alternatives like Gab. On the one hand, Twitter's made it clear that I'm not welcome, and I don't like the idea of crawling back with my tail between my legs. But on the other hand, I relied on Twitter a lot, being a smaller channel, and it was the primary way of directi directly connecting with my audience and other content creators. What are your thoughts? So, I guess uh, if you guys have uh, thoughts or opinions on uh, what Theron should do, you can go, if you're not following her on Facebook, you could do that, or you can just like reply with a comment in here. Um, I will let Theron know that we talked about her situation, so she'll probably take a look at what we're, what you guys are talking about. So, do I mean... Do not shed a quarter of a tear for Twitter. No, no, <laughs> no. There's no reason to be sad for not being on Twitter anymore. I, I, I'd, li I'd like to get to one day where I do it, just, I choose to do it. One day I'm just gonna go, right, fuck you, Twitter. Yeah, no, perfect record, and now I'm going. And if they put me, I'm like, okay, you've done that for me now. Wicked. <laughs> yeah, my my main issue with with uh, Gab, I'm, I mean, I, and I'm on Gab, but nobody else is, so it's kind of like it's you know it's that catch twenty two thing. Like you want it to be a bigger platform so that you can use it, but if everyone who Twitter doesn't like just goes to Gab, then you might have a echo chamber in Gab. So you might not actually be able to, to like the, the point of all this stuff. I think anyway is to confront people that have uh, opinions that you don't agree with to discuss it with them. If you don't have that tension between two opposing, you know, ideas or whatever, then nothing gets done. So it's unfortunate because Twitter is basically removing people that they don't like, which basically makes it safer for the people they do like. But then they never get to talk to the people who disagree with them. And we'll get more into that later. But th this is what's the, what the fuck is happening with social media. Well, you know, the, the, the point about Twitter possibly being more bots than users right now is actually interesting. Because uh, I do run into a lot of accounts that have bot-like bot -like behavior. Uh, and particularly, they'll, they'll answer something that you've said with, with something that seems like a stock answer for some keywords in the sentence that you said. Um, and it's, I, I've noticed that quite a bit with, in, like if I make an anti-feminist tweet, I will get two or three of these, these feminist seeming accounts that have uh, generic or no avatar at all. And, and they'll actually do that. They'll, they'll uh, make these seeming stock answers for, for things that I've said. And I wonder if, uh, Twitter's, uh, this goes back oh, to, Theron, to uh, legality. Sorry. Uh, uh, Hannah, sorry. Theron is in the chat. She says, it's the TERFs. It's the so, TERFs. It's yeah, the TERFs. The, TERFs. the TERFs are really, really rabid on Twitter. The young TERFs. Uh, they're, they're absolutely nuts. And some of them are, they use language that if it were directed at them from anybody else, they would consider it violence. But it's not when they say it. Uh, but in any case, I'm kind of wondering if the number of bots 
the versus the number of users on on Twitter and and, and their ad sales and the numbers that they're giving to advertisers and then you know the numbers based on on, on which they are selling their ad space um, is is legal I'm wondering if the Federal Trade Commission ought to look into that because uh, it seems to me this is well this is this is a serious point I got, it's one okay. thing to have um, Oh, one thing to have, you know, people being assholes to each other and uh, them getting rid of accounts that they don't like and all that. That's that's a whole separate complaint. But the idea about all these bots on, on Twitter, if if there's a significant portion of Twitter users now that are just bots, then they're selling ads based on fake views, which is what I think Facebook just got into trouble over because of their bots. Mm -hmm. So it might be something to look into. And it might even be something to, to contact the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. about. And if if the same thing is taking place in Canada, it might be uh, there might be a point to that as well. Uh, whatever type of commission you have in Canada, um, to to take a, a look into whether or not Twitter is selling ads based on accurate numbers of views and clicks. Yeah. Theron also says, she says, she's in the chat still. She says, pretty sure Turfs got me banned with mass reporting after I called Turf goddess Megan Murphy a cunt. Turfs are very organized. And uh, someone else. Oh, and I've run into Megan Murphy, and she is absolutely. In fact, it's actually, it's kind of an insult to cunts everywhere to call her that because that's, that's too nice of a name for yeah. her. So that, that's what's going on with that. Theron, we love you. And uh, whatever you decide to do is cool. Um, I, I can understand your dilemma, though. So we'll, we'll have the people discuss it in the chat. And also thank you, Prince of Queens, for your supporting uh, supportive words. Somebody asked what a TERF is. It means trans-exclusionary radical feminist. So you know. That means feminists who hate trans people, specifically men that transition into women. Can we, we just call not... TEFs from now on? They're not even radical. They're yeah, there just you go. more yeah. feminists now. They're, yeah, they're just TEFs. <laughs> well, they think they're tough, so <laughs> that fits. Yeah. It would it would be fun. Not that, not that I'm suggesting anybody do anything, but it would be quite hilarious if somebody who knows how to make Twitter bots would, would make an army of bots to call her a cunt. Yeah. So uh, good luck with that, Theron, whatever happens. So I'm going to go on and get to the next story. Uh, man on fire. A New Zealand man who set himself on fire outside the parliament has died from his injuries. The man, whose name has yet to be released, set himself on fire outside of the Wellington building and was rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Although his reasons are not entirely clear, witnesses state that he's been hold he was seen holding a placard relating to family court and that his self-immolation may have been a form of protest. This theory seems possible, given that the tightly contested New Zealand general election is only days away. New Zealand police describe the event as, quote, highly unusual and extremely unfortunate. I mean, it's just a tragedy I wanted to share. I know that we've had incidents like this of, of, of uh, men that uh, set themselves on fire uh, for protest purposes. So even though there isn't much information on this story, and we don't do a lot from New Zealand, so I, I thought, you know, we should uh, get some eyes on that. So you guys see that this stuff is going on all over the world, so. I wouldn't this want this kind of stuff to happen without stories about it. I wonder how often this happens when I mean, you don't hear stories about it, you know. Yeah. I know, it's, it's reminiscent, re reminiscent of the uh, Thomas Ball self-immolation, actually. Um, and, and uh, like with this guy having a, a, a placard, he had been holding a placard related to family court. I suspect it's probably a very similar story. And, uh, this is, this is one that, you know, when men do this, feminists end up blaming them and accusing them of trying to use their suicide to, to hurt other people. But the reality is this is a situation where somebody has, has, has reached the end of his rope and then continued and and uh then this is where he ends up um you cannot take away everything that you have trained a man from childhood to believe is his reason for living you can't tell him 
your reason for living is to to make a family and support that family. You can't tell him that your reason for living is for other people and then tell him that he can't have those other people in his life and that he can't be dedicated to those other people and then he can't love and care about and protect those other people that he's he's expected to love and and care for and protect and expect that no man will ever go off the deep end in any way shape or form because of that situation and different men are going to react to it different ways and some of them are going to create a spectacle in whatever way that they can in order to demonstrate this is wrong and you have to stop doing it and some of them are willing to do so at, at the cost of their own severe pain and suffering in the hopes that people will notice that this is wrong and it should stop and I'll almost guarantee you you know the minute feminists get wind of this they'll start blaming the victim and they'll start accusing him of being abusive and they'll start blaming toxic masculinity anything but admit that it is extremely destructive to break up families and to separate men from their families to separate children from their fathers and that it is just as wrong that it is destructive to the man to the father as it is that it is destructive to the children yeah well said hannah uh we don't have I any just, other go ahead i Kat. want to say one thing um i i've uh, been in a, a, a job where um you know it has a high suicide rate the military and had training on like the whole suicide thing i just want to say you know if you see people out there with like indicators where they're giving their stuff away or they're just down on their luck you know the best thing you can do too is just you know reach out to that person and you know i mean at least try to you know yeah lift them up a little bit you know definitely that's a that's a good good advice we we um had a show about the military uh, men in the military uh, a while back and where the suicide was a big topic so thanks for those thanks for that so the um as far as the story goes we don't have any other info again there wasn't much to go on but we're going to try and keep our eyes on it to find out why this happened maybe we can learn more um it's just uh it's just tragic and i thought oh, you guys should know that this had happened so and it, it probably like mike was alluding to it probably happens more than we would like to believe it just doesn't get reported on as often so speaking of mike all right to you again next story france tackling street harassment of women by andrew g one of the oft complained about issues that feminists whine about is the act of men quote catcalling women on the street. The French government seems willing to tackle this supposed rampant issue of street harassment. Marlene Schappe, France's new gender equality minister, <laughs> set up a working group of five lawmakers in an attempt to determine the legal definition for street harassment. Schappe said that, quote, the idea is to characterize street harassment so that the police can impose fines on men who follow women on the streets, <sighs> intimidate them and harass them in public. Nowadays, when a woman is whistled at in the street, insulted or followed, that's not classed as an assault or harassment because there are no elements of proof. We will create a new offense to define its contours, the evidence and the sanction, a spoken warning and then a fine. End quote. What spurred government officials was a government survey conducted in 2015 asking 600 women in the saint saint and Esson suburbs of Paris, if they had encountered street harassment, a whopping 100% of those surveyed said yes. However, the only mention of this survey seems to come from an article in the local stating that the High Council for Equality bet between Women and Men sent a report to France's Minister of Social Justice Affairs. <laughs> Minister of Social is... Justice Affairs? <laughs> Minister of Social Justice Affairs, for real, real. There is Do no they have a ministry of silly walks too? <laughs> Does he wear a robe? <laughs> oh god! There is no information about the survey provided, such as the questions, the definitions used for street harassment, and a response rate. 
while there can be no denying that street harassment exists in some places, the question of how widespread of a problem it is remains to be answered. For now, though, France and its self-proclaimed feminist president, Emmanuel Macron, seem to think that creating fines for the supposed rampant issue of street harassment is worthy of the French government's time and money. Wowzers. <laughs> what the fuck, France? <sighs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this is really sad. I I thought France had bigger problems. I don't know, <laughs> but I, okay. They're they're conflating. Uh, feminists are conflating, conflating two issues to come up with this street harassment thing. Okay, um, there there are real live assholes in the world. Big surprise! Oh my God, there's assholes, right? Uh, and there there are people who will do shit like that. There are people of both sexes who will do shit like that to a degree that it is more than upsetting. Um, and it, uh, you know, I've, I've had that from both sexes and, and it's very rare in the population, but you run into them, you know, depending on, on where you're, where you happen to be. But the other end of it, the, uh, the idea of being whistled at is that the idea that that's abhorrent is ridiculous. The idea of somebody saying hello to you being abhorrent is ridiculous. You know, the idea of somebody walking on the street, same street you're walking on. In the same a direction. Bit behind you, in the same direction, being abhorrent and terrifying is ridiculous. Uh, and, and it's, there, it brings to mind something that one of the guys at, said at, at the Mix Up Meetup this weekend. We were talking, we got to talk about a lot of different things as we we're wandering around the Wren and as we were, were uh, wandering around the museum and everything. And one of them is living things have a tendency, the more adversity they face to get stronger and the more sheltered they are to get weaker. And this, this can be uh, seen in a variety of different ways. We were talking about germs. Um, and, and if you completely eliminate all of the germs in your environment and you never encounter any germs and then you come across something, uh, e even a weaker germ, your immune system is not prepared to deal with it because it hasn't had to fight. You know, and if you raise a kid in a neighborhood where all of the other kids handle conflict by going home and standing on their front porch and yelling at each other, you can't come in my yard. And then they go somewhere where people handle conflict by hitting each other in the face with their fists. They're not prepared to deal with that because they've never had to defend against it. And if you outlaw human contact between the sexes because some women are special snowflakes and they think everything all men do is harassment when, when, when men do it and only when men do it, uh, then when they run into the type of, of fellow or female, when they run into another woman who is genuinely physically aggressive, who is genuinely trying to intimidate them, they won't be prepared to handle it because everything is aggression and they're protected from all of it. And of course, at the other end of it, believe it or not, wolf whistling is flirting. And, <laughs> and I, you know, feminists can cherry pick that and, and bitch about it all they want. But most of the time, when women complain about being whistled at when they walk down the street, they're not mad. They're humble bragging. That guy was looking at my ass is humble bragging. It's not bitching. It's humble bragging. And now we are making laws in, in various areas based on taking humble bragging seriously. Also, this consider, is the worst timeline. It is. Uh, also consider the way that uh, Shiapa frames this statement. She says, nowadays, so currently, when a woman is whistled out on the street, insulted or followed, it's not classed as assault <laughs> because assault is should be when you are insulted whistled at or followed whatever the fuck any of those actually mean and then on followed, top of that followed is really fucking scary sorry yeah, carry on no followed is really fucking scary like this is remember when we talked about nottingham this is way worse than that potentially so she says well, you know what else it makes me think of 
there there was a time when you know because of the the slave era era and because of Jim Crow laws, black people were not allowed to look white people in the eye. Yeah. And they were not allowed to walk on the same side of the street. That's why I made the people. eye contact joke uh, when I was because yeah. I was thinking about Jim Crow because that's basically and what it, it is. This is Jim, very, this Jim is Crow Jim for the Crow genders. For men. Yeah, for men specifically. We're gonna have our own water fountains and bathrooms. It's gonna be great. So the, and she also says so on top of that. Okay, so the sufficient uh, restrictions we have, the definitions for assault, they're not right. They don't. They're not appropriate. Okay. So we need to expand that. She says, we will need to create a new offense to define its contours, the evidence, and the sanction. So we need to basically make it as easy as possible for a woman to decide if she is being assaulted or harassed by a man. I don't even think that this is... Because, again, the assumption is this harassment is only applied to women. It's not even like men wouldn't have this because it's not applied to them it's applied to women specifically not that men don't encounter street harassment oh no so i'm i I wanted to add i'm a local jogger and like the middle-aged woman gaze is real oh yeah (laughs) like i get i get whistled at from time to time um are they supposed to be arrested in this case no no they can't be they're they're just like they're just like seizing their uh you know, you, that's a you go girl moment. You're supposed to congratulate them for that. In fact, I think that if you don't immediately give them whatever they want sexually, you're the one that's going to suffer a fine because you're denying them, you know, what the, what they're entitled to. So, no, you, you, can't, you can't do that. Sorry. It doesn't work that way. You're a white male. <laughs> I, 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 I can refrain from wolf whistling on the street. That's I'm not even very good at whistling. I can I can even refrain from insulting people on the street. I t- all I have to do is not talk to anyone on the street ever, and that's already what I do. But I don't know how I how I refrain from accidentally following someone because I have, especially on the streets of a city like Paris, when you're constantly surrounded by a crowd of a hundred people, and you have to make sure that you're not walking at the same pace at the same distance for any particular person, or they might get get it into their head that that you're um, assaulting them is what it's called now. Yeah. <laughs> But yes. accidentally assault someone if you walk behind them for too long. Yeah. Because obviously it's not, it's not a crime. I mean, stalking is a crime, but you can't get from following to stalking without clear evidence, and that's already impossible. I mean, if you're a man or a woman, right? You can't go into a police station and say a man is following me. <laughs> you need evidence or something. Right. And even even they're, camera they're evidence gonna, isn't going to work. They're going to make the old fishing uh, park ranger joke real. The so the guy that gets uh, gets accosted by a park ranger for illegally fishing, you know, he's he's there uh, next to next to the pier with his vehicle, and you know the 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 trunk of his car is open, and there's fishing tackle in there. Uh, got his pole and everything. But he's not actually fishing, and uh, he points that out to the ranger. You can't ticket me for fishing. I'm not actually fishing. I don't have my pole out. I don't have the 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 uh, hook in the water. I don't have, you know, no, I don't even have my tackle box isn't even open. What the hell are you ticketing me for? And uh, you know, the the ranger says, "Oh, it's it's very clear what you intended to do here, sir. You have all the equipment." And mm-hmm. at that point, the uh, fellow's wife gets out of the car and says, "Well, in that case, I'm going to report you to the police for rape." And the you know, range says, that's preposterous. I'm just standing here. I haven't done anything to you. Why could you possibly report me? She goes, well, you got all the equipment. And, and one of these days, that's going to be all it takes. You got all the equipment. You know, and, and this is where they're headed. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> also, there was one other thing I was going to bring up. Oh, yeah. You could. I, I want to see how this is going to apply in France when there are a a large and growing number of people that have a religion that may be a problem because France may not want to be, you know, called racist or anything. I wonder if they're going to be able to apply this across the board to the new, the new residents of Paris, let's put it that way, (laughs) that are sort of moving in because, um, or, or if this is their response to, stuff that's been happening in France and this is how they're dealing with it. I don't know. 
So their problems have only just begun if this is actually what they think is going to solve their, their issues. Yeah, this is this is a really dumb – if that is the case, this is a really dumb way to uh, to handle it Absolutely. actually. And, and the reason it's a really dumb way to handle it is just what I, I, I pointed out before. Uh, this will not stop the, the, the behavior. What it'll do is it'll it'll make everybody that's subject to it more vulnerable to it. This is probably uh, if, if it, this is how they're dealing with the migrant crisis. This is probably the dumbest way to do it. Yeah, dumbest possible way. Yeah, it's redefine redefine assault uh, to include could be assaulting. You know, assault is actually the act of threatening to batter someone <laughs> in one way or another. Um, or, or uh, you know, yelling at someone can maybe be considered assault under some circumstances, but just being in the same place and moving in the same direction as someone is not an assault. You know, fl trying to flirt badly with someone is not an assault. Saying hi to someone is not an assault. Saying someone's name is not an assault. And asking for someone's phone number is not an assault. And it's trying to define these things as assault in order to prevent behaviors that are worse doesn't stop those behaviors all it does is is create a, a group of people that are so sensitized to human contact that everything feels like an assault to them if they really wanted to combat something like that if there are really assaults taking place or, or there are really people trying to intimidate other people on the street the smart thing would be to to uh, teach people to defend themselves you know, and and to not prosecute people for defending themselves when it's obvious that that's what they were doing, regardless of the sex or ethnicity or religious background or anything else of the person who attacked them. And to prosecute when someone actually does assault and batter another person without, you know, being in, in the act of self-defense regardless of who they are. That would solve a lot of problems. They wouldn't have to consider making ridiculous steps like this uh, their solution. Well, I don't know. France, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but it seems like you guys have given up once again. So, let's go on to the final story. The Road to Comics Gate. This is kind of a long write-up because I had a lot to say about this, so. During Gamergate's height, there was a discussion around whether the focus should be on ethics in games journalism or challenging the creeping orthodoxy of social justice in media in general. The social justice orthodoxy being the top-down force of creators turned authoritarians who believe not only that their views are correct, but that they are morally superior or even pragmatic. Their creations became less about inviting people to think or allowing for discussion, demonizing even those that may not disagree with the politics per se, but protest to having ideological sermons preached through all their forms of entertainment. Can't we stop for two fucking seconds so that we can watch a football game? The fight against social justice orthodoxy is part of a greater culture war, in my opinion. Politics are creeping into everything we do, and it's ruining everything. We at Honey Badger Radio have ourselves been banned from the Calgary Expo for showing support for Gamergate, which damaged Allison's aspirations of selling comics at a venue that is made specifically to sell comics because we didn't have the right ideas. Moving on to what I want to talk about here, which, as you know, is one of my interests, comics. I believe we are all well on our way to a comics gate. Allison Tiemann and myself are both comic creators working on our individual projects that aim to come from a novel perspective. And we at Honey Badger Radio have criticized comics through, through the past couple of years, from Marvel's Female Four to Feminist Mockingbird, Unsolicited Opinions on Israel, and others. For us, the writing was on the wall for some time. Today, there is a growing discussion on the future of comics by many concerned fans. Comic sales have been declining, I mean severely declining, while some YouTubers that criticize comic chick tracks, such as Mim Headroom, Micah Curtis, Aiden Paladin, Captain Cummings, and Diversity in Comics, have been gaining subscribers and support. Clearly, this is not an isolated group of people. Things began to take shape in the growing comic culture war with a hashtag known as Make Mine Milkshake, 
where Marvel Comics writer Heather Antos tweeted a selfie of her and her fellow Marvel co-workers getting milkshakes. Antos captioned the tweet, quote, It's the Marvel Milkshake Crew, hashtag Fabulous Flow, end quote. The post received more than 520 retweets and 4,100 likes in less than a week. Despite the overwhelming support and all the you go girls that Antos received, she still managed to be the victim because a few people also made critical or negative tweets in response. She tweeted afterwards saying, quote, woke up today to a slew of more garbage tweets and DMs for being a woman in comics who posted a selfie of her friends getting milkshakes. End quote. Several media outlets covered the story and joyously jumped on board to save the women's train, such as the Daily Dot, the Rap, Comic Book Resources, Bleeding Cool, the Mary Sue, and more. But it didn't end there. Comic book YouTubers who are concerned with the future of comics continue to make content examining the ways in which modern comics suck. From bad writing to bad art and really odd choices both in character design, replacements, and plot designs. There are too many examples for me to go into here, but to keep things simple, let's say the sales of Marvel and DC Comics are at a very, very pathetic numbers, and it doesn't make sense for them to go to be so bad, since superhero films are doing very well and should be pulling on this new market. This brings me to what I believe is the catalyst and ultimate evidence of a comics gate. A secret Facebook group of various writers from DC, Marvel, and other publishing groups, including B. Clay Moore, Isaac Goodhart, Kelly Thompson, and Taylor Esposito, plotted to harass YouTuber diversity in comics, one of the more prominent dissenting voices at New York Comic Con, in an attempt to bait the YouTuber to violent action as an excuse to hit him back. This was after the SJWs tried to dox him because they didn't like him making content, content rather, that didn't kiss their ass. Top Cow writer Isaac Goodhart said he warned um, New York Comic Con about diversity in comics presence at the con and that security should be aware of him. Lastly, we have Mark Wade, writer for DC Comics who decided to post a lengthy Facebook post regarding the issue of harassment in the comics industry supposedly coming from concerned fans and enthusiasts towards what he called young creators of gender and of color and LGBTQ creators. Yeah, creators of gender. I don't even know what that fucking means because it really, what it really means is creators that are women, not men. Wade says that this harassment only comes from fringe fans and in no way reflects the market as a whole, but still felt the need to write a long diatribe which amounts to nothing more than a self-righteous virtue signal and a call to action to beat back the trolls and be a good person, whatever the fuck that means. He ironically ends his post with, quote, I'm surrounded by a lot of good, concerned people as we work on this, most of whom are smarter and more aware than I am. Together, we're going to do what we can to help tamp down the anger and hate that is hurting us all. If this is something that matters to you, you are more than welcome to be part of the conversation. If you just need to speak privately, we will listen. Either way, your voice is valued and we will hear you. I'm going to read that last part again. Either way, your voice is valued and we will hear you. It's also worth pointing out that Mark Wade, in case you didn't know this, he celebrated Honey Badger Radio being kicked from the, from the Calgary Expo when it happened a couple of years back, saying, quote, I have no interest in ever being a guest at any convention that would sell booth space to Gamergate. Any pros with me on this? End quote. And he also wrote, quote, kudos to Calgary Expo for dealing with a hate group promptly. Comicsgate? Comicsgate. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? It's taken him a while to deal with one hate group I can think of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Still haven't dealt with it there, have you? So this is not anything new. We've actually had Mark Wade uh, talking about us way before this ever happened. So I thought that would be that was a super interesting bit of info. What's yeah, interesting about my notes that I did? A lot of the stuff that I had, you know, planned out in my head deals with Mark Wade as well. Um, from my understanding, you know, talking with different pros and stuff like that, he's somebody that loves the spotlight and putting himself out there, you know, as the leader, you know, who's also 
his words are very threatening a lot of the times. That, that's all I got. So it's likely that he's inserting himself into this simply because it's under discussion publicly and, and it'll it'll basically put him in the center of something that people will be talking about, in other words. Virtue, where are you? <laughs> that's not a big surprise. Now, you probably can expect to see that happen with with a lot of people. And I will bet we will see some 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 uh, folks in the I guess you could say uh, nerd celeb community, if there's a community, but the nerd celeb population for sure, that maybe weren't comics oriented will suddenly start becoming comics nerds just to comment on this so that they can be uh, in the midst of the virtue signaling. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I would expect that to happen. If this happens to, uh, to pick up steam as no, no pun intended, um, <laughs> at the rate that Gamergate did, and it probably will. I, I would say, I expect that. Uh, expect to be written about, demonized, um, lied about, uh, cherry picked, and have your words twisted. Expect to be portrayed as uh, losers. Expect to be told that the consumers are not the reason that the this business exists and and that uh, the creations are not made to to sell to the consumer they're you know this is art and and it's just to be done for art's sake and how dare you not buy it there's something wrong with you uh, you know it'll it'll be all the same thing that we heard before during gamergate's heyday and and we'll probably see some of the same hallmarks of uh uh, corruption in journalism regarding it. I'm sure we've already seen quite a bit. We'll probably see some of the same things regarding it. I, I know there's probably some, so there's awards for everything. There's got to be awards for this too. And we'll probably find out that there's uh, corruption involved there as well. I just, I, I, I can see this all panning out, you know, playing out, it's probably going to be pretty much the same because there's already significant evidence that there, there's not just a social justice invasion of the comics industry. They've already kind of taken over to a degree. And uh, I, I would I would not be surprised uh, to find out everything we learned about the games industry and the games journalism industry is probably happening as well uh, in the comics industry and the journalism industry surrounding it. And and the, the um, not con contests but awards industry as well the the basically the merit industry as well and, and it looks to me like an attempt to kill meritocracy uh to whatever degree it can exist oh yeah in in these industries well and, and uh, an attempt to insert collectivism yeah absolutely i mean there i've been okay so there are there are some differences like the um, the comics industry is not as big as the because people are asking, is this going to be as big as Gamergate was? And the thing is, the video game, so. the, no, because the video game industry is the biggest entertainment industry I think that ever was, not just the, that currently is, but that ever was. So it won't be as big as that. Another thing is, is that comics are not doing as well as they used to, so the audience itself has shrunk. Now, part of it may be, I would say, at least in part has to do with the way that, you know, things are being written these days. Like, um, nobody's interested in these stories. And the people who are, uh, you know, currently telling them, they are not trying to make stories for the market. In fact, I saw this, uh, I, I gotta find it, but there was a, there is a, uh, what's her name? Maggie Visaggio? Is that Mag her name? Maggie Visaggio. Ma Maggie Visaggio, who is a, a trans writer for, she worked for Marvel, I think. I, I can tell you all about this story. Uh, yeah, what happened is um, she got her job infested with bed bugs and then did a Kickstarter to help with that. And from what it looks like, she found out that comics has become infested with social justice and then so pitched a trans book to a far left publication, uh, Black Mask. And it was called Kim and Kim. Uh, from that time, she's done uh two other like uh titles and those issues sell about two thousand copies per issue 
And from that time now, she's gotten books at Marvel and now an actual internship at DC where she's going to be learning to write by Scott Snyder, who's a, a prominent, uh, you know, guy in the industry. Right. Uh, obvious. I mean, that, that's, that, that should stink of uh, nepotism or something, right? Because it's not like it's earned. And here's the thing about mags, which what I was going to say is that, um, you know, a Hannah was talking about meritocracy. And I was talking about how if you want to make it in comics, you should respond to your market. I apologize for the uh, for the sounds I'm making. It's the chemo. It's affecting my um, uh, it's affecting my my throat. But anyway, uh, the Mags herself tweeted out that a, a writer, she, she's an aspiring writer, uh, a, an author should never should only write stuff for themselves and never market like towards their market audience. So basically, the idea is if she says, I do this for me and this is how it should be, if I have to write for the people who buy my product, then I'm selling my soul. And this is the thing that is, is it's backwards. Like when you're telling, when you're, when you um, are given uh, a, a, you know, a show or a comic book or whatever, you know, to tell a story with, you are given something that has a legacy and a history and it has an established base. If you want to tell your own stories, obviously, you know, be true to yourself. Sure. And if you build an audience, great. But if, if somebody's handing you something, I'm not saying you can't do that, but I think that it's marketedly unwise to try to do your own thing with something that already has an established fan base and then act like you have every right to do it. Not only do you have a right to do it, but you have to do it to be true to yourself because that's how you alienate your mark, your audience. This is what happened with most of these writers, the Gabby Rivera's and the, um, Oh, what's the name of the guy who made Captain America a Nazi? Um, Nick Spencer, Nick Spencer's right. And the dude who took over GI Joe, all these, these guys, they, they, they write what they think they want to do. And they say, fuck the audience, fuck the market, fuck the people who like to read this stuff, fuck the people who grew up with this stuff. They, they're not important. What's important is I tell the story I want to tell. And a lot of times, this is how you alienate your audience. This is how you essentially, you, you cause the sales to tank. Anyway, I'm going to give it back to you, Captain. I came in on a, a, a weird perspective, you know, because I wasn't very political when Gamergate was going on. You know, I was in the comics. I followed all these creators. And so, like, they all hated Gamergate from what I've seen. And, you know, so I immediately was like, oh, well, you know, F Gamergate. <laughs> and then from that time forward, I look into it and I go, oh, well, these guys, I I'm in a weird position now because <laughs> I don't agree with them. Yeah. You know, and, and as it goes on and as it goes on, you can see that, you know, they don't, it just really feels like they don't like the fans. And, you know, they don't. <sighs> They're not clear in perspective on why they do the thing, the, the job, you know, if you don't like who you're writing for and you don't like comic book heroes, you know, how could you write a comic book about Captain America that becomes a Nazi and likes superheroes? Well, like, that, that's a well, that, question for I, me. I, yeah. I mean, like, I think, OK, so I, I'm I'm OK with them putting these twists on things like I I've. I read a bunch of old um, Jack Kirby stuff because, you know, they did these mm -hmm. reprints of Jack Kirby stuff. And then when I went to the store to buy them, I also went and essentially hunted down, uh, you know, like Marvel Masterworks and like these various sort of collections that put together a lot of these old books and read them. And there were these kinds of twists, you know, where you would say, oh, this person is bad. You know, how did that happen? And, and then you read through it and it's like, oh, I see there's a twist here or whatever. I'm okay with them doing that. But the thing about... The way they're doing the, I'm okay with, okay, let me, let me rephrase this. I'm okay with them doing that in principle. If the idea is to essentially shock your audience to thinking, oh my God, how could this possibly happen? And then they reveal some twist later. Okay. But the thing is when you pair that with Nick Spencer's, that's his name, right? Nick Spencer's yeah. uh, views on, you know, his, his political views that he doesn't have a problem talking about on Twitter. Um, his low opinion of America as a country, then you get this different sense that this isn't just, uh, you know, some kind of a, a stunt or gimmick to get people to buy the book, but it's actually his feelings 
on it and he's actually trying to reflect what he really believes things should be like and this is actually um far more of a problem because then it's like well why are you shitting on us like we know we're the fans this is what we like why are you doing this and then of course his response is to become more vitriolic you know against uh, the fans and this is it's not even really good writing it's sort of like well where did this come from this is why i think because marvel ended up as far as the nazi captain america story uh, as far as I understand it, they ended up making it work like he's some cap from another dimension and, you know, all that. But but then it feels really, you know, kind of ham-fisted and boring because they did, it's like they started with something and then the response wasn't what they wanted. So they tried to fix it and it just ends up looking really sloppy. So exactly. yeah, ask yourself, right. So you're, it, that's what I'm saying. Like, it comes what it comes down to is um, the people who are writing these books... And it's mostly artists. I mean, not, not artists. It's mostly writers. The artists are generally okay, and they're just doing their job. Although there are some that I'm like, how did you get a job here? Because we've already done uh, some videos about <laughs> Mockingbird, and I talked about Squirrel Girl and stuff like that. Holy shit, that some of that art is awful. But mostly it's the writers and the editors. And they, the, 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 there is definitely, definitely diversity hires happening and people who are not good at their job who don't have an interest in the medium who don't like what they're doing who have um a, a vested interest in pushing their own politics into it and i don't mean in a subtle way and in an un it, it's completely ham-fisted it's completely lazy it's not very good and i think it's it, it it's really uh obvious and it's actually hurting their sales does that make sense? Well, there's um, I can specific the diversity hires you're dead on. So okay, um, what happened like like 2015, 2016? A lot of their top guys, girls and guys, uh, left and went their own way. They were like, "F Marvel, we're out of here." And so what happened is, um, it seemed like a lot of feminists were attacking them for not having blacks writing blade or you know women writing women characters and all this you know the stuff that they usually do and so it seems like uh tom brevort and axel alonzo who are the top editors at marvel you know took that as like that's what the fans want and so now you see all these young adult authors you know from other industries coming in and there's one that's named uh i don't know what her last name is but the, her first name is rainbow and she's running the Runaways, which is oh, whoa, a wait. Her first name is Rainbow. Yeah. Uh, uh, some people told me they uh, she, apparently. Maybe I shouldn't say the state. Uh, they saw her at a signing and they talked to her, and she seemed nice. I read the book, and there wasn't anything clear and present danger in in the sense of uh, social justice okay. in the first issue. All right. But you can see the clear difference in quality between. A, a, a really top-notch comic book writer that knows how the medium works and somebody that, you know, it's their first comic book. Right. Okay. Yeah, and, um, well, from everything that I've, I've said, what, what, other, what other things are going on? Because I know that you've been way more involved in this than me mm -hmm. uh, because I've been... Well, yeah, and the thing stuff. is, um, like, it really... Um, I saw it going on from Gamergate, and you could see stuff, you know, happening. Uh, people coming in and, you know, saying, oh, well, I only hire people. I did a paper where the editor says she hires people based off what sort of voice that she can do for women and that sort of thing. And over time, you know, I just didn't know what to really do about it. And so there was like a triggering moment. For me, and um, you know, I really saw it hit books that I liked reading. So the the book I'm talking about is All New, All Different Avengers Annual Number One, ironically written by Mark Wade, um, <laughs> where a moment they antagonize the fans by doing this whole mantle thing with Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel, and the original Marvel comes in. And basically, Miss Marvel, the ending joke is maybe I should go make some muffins for all the Avengers or something like that. You know, saying that all the guys want her to go bake for them. And I was just like, what? I can't deal with this anymore. <laughs> like, I have to I have to speak up about it. And so this is what 
has made me come, you know, and, you know, do the things that I do because I'm fed up with, you know, this whole thing going on. And, um, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. You've seen a stark decrease in quality from artwork and writing. Uh, a big thing that, that you guys were talking about a minute ago is with the awards. So the big award show for uh, comic books is the Eisners. You know, Will Eisner is the great comic book uh, cartoonist. and Known, then known for the spirit. Yeah. And so um, that's what the award's name is. Squirrel Girl. You guys know Squirrel Girl probably. Yeah. Uh, the Crunch Fest that is. Six Eisners this year. What? I so, could be wrong on the number. You'd have to Google it. But it's stuff like Squirrel Girl. It's all this, like, if it, it's not stuff that's good, you know, like Batman or, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah. It's if it fits the right narrative. I think, oh, wait a second. Um, the woman that wrote that Mockingbird book that you were just talking about yeah. was nominated for that book. What? That book is awful. It was the worst. It was terrible. Bad art and worse writing. I was... honestly want to find that cover okay. just for like no. collecting, you know, the worst, like the end of comic books. That's yeah. going to be like the key book for. <laughs> That's terrible. So, okay. I want to, I want to, okay. So I want to uh, identify, to clarify what, I want to identify what the actual problems are because um, it's important to this to make the distinction between a creator's freedom to do whatever they want and people that just don't like the way they're going about it and stuff that actually is contentious. So, um, the, the, the majority of the problems that people who are being critical have with the current comic book industry is a few things. One, there is definitely an orthodoxy within the comics industry and not just with the big companies. There are people who say, well, you know, you can just like make your own stuff. Sure enough, that's fine. But um, the the thing is, if, if there are people who are really talented and good at what they do, but they don't fit the right politics, they're going to have a hard time getting work, doing anything really good. So the and the the way that the orthodoxy is currently set up is that there are a lot of people who are mediocre or bad at what they do, doing stuff that has legacy of over fifty years in many cases of like these titles have been going for a long, long time. And as a result of that, the market isn't responding. People don't have an interest, so they're losing money. So the people who are speaking out are people who really, really care about the industry, like they want it to be big. I was talking to my, um, my wife about, about this, and I, I think it was a really important point that was made. She was saying that, you know, well, if the market takes them down, then it just does, you know, like if Marvel goes under, for example, then that's just the way it goes. And I agree with that, you know, in principle, but I'd like to try to see it saved because the thing is, if Marvel goes down, while well, on the one hand, you would have like, you know, uh, opportunities for other people to make it, it's gonna sink several comic book shops and distributors because that's a lot of what they invest in. So it's actually gonna hurt the industry a lot. It may even cause a crash because this is like too big to allow to happen that way, not without a fight anyway, without saying something and saying, look, you know, you guys got to fix your shit. The problem is, is that normally in the, in a free market system, people will respond to the market by saying, this has to change. Who do we need to fire and who do we need to replace? And then they just do it. But now there's an ideological motive to keep them regardless and also blame the audience by saying, well, these people aren't buying the books, but they should be, because if they're not, then they're, you know, misogynist, transphobic, whatever, um, homophobes, etc., racists. And the, the, nobody's responding to it. So what people are, are saying is they want the books to, to cater to their audience. So this is not as, it's not quite as straightforward as Gamergate is, which was more about talking to games journos um, about, you know, doing their reporting fairly and also removing the cronyism and stuff. This is also has some elements of the cronyism and nepotism stuff because there's diversity hiring and there are people who are being brought on board for ideological reasons, but these people are also talentless and the, the, um, the journals aren't really playing that much of a role. I mean, Bleeding Cool is pretty cancerous, but for the most part, it's actually from within the industry itself, which is damaging the product. So it's almost like, um... 
It's like if somebody took over a company that doesn't know what they're doing, but you like the company's products and you like want the company to keep making good products, but you're afraid that that person is going to destroy it from the inside. And so you're speaking out and saying, could you guys please do something about this? Uh, you know, we'd like to, to see this do better and it's not happening. And then on top of that, you're getting blamed for it. Right. Well, and I, I think a good, a good thing to point out too, is a lot of it is Marvel. And, um, when you look over at the DC side, you know, this, uh, the, the DC versus Marvel thing, um, I've always been a huge Marvel reader, but, um, DC is, is really like killing it on the ideas aspect, you know, of diversity of ideas. So you have the, the, the cringy, you know, books, you have Superman, which they, uh, he used to be an emo type character in the new 52 or whatever. They relaunched him as a family man. So he's back with Lois Lane. He has a son now that he's looking over. Um, he's a big Patriot now, you know, that's something that would never happen at Marvel. Oh, that's interesting that you say that because, um, um, Mark Wade said he was going to be talking about Superman and how all the stuff that we're dealing with right now, he actually recently made a post about this saying that, um, this is not, what Superman stands for, he stands for diversity and inclusion and all this. So he's actually going to be using him as a bit of a, uh, well, I'm just saying, look out because there could be some propaganda coming is what I'm saying. He's a huge Superman fan. <laughs> so anyway, you were, you were saying, I'm, I cut you off before. Oh yeah. So yeah. So then they also have, you know, people like uh, Gail Simone. I don't know if you guys know who Gail Simone is. Oh uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we're on the same page then. Um, you know, and she's she's one of the most toxic people. Like, uh, you say anything to her and she, like, tries to twist it on you. And it's like, you said the same sort of nasty thing to me. I mean, what are you, what are you talking about sort of thing? And, you know, that's fine. You know, I don't have a problem if they have books for everyone. You know, that's what the whole diversity of ideas is supposed to be about, in my opinion. I may not like those books and I won't buy them. And if they succeed, they succeed. And if they fail, they fail. The, the difference is, is at Marvel, you were hitting on, um, when a book fails, they cancel it. They don't change anything about it. And then they relaunch it with the number one with the same people doing the book again. And it's like, it's like shooting yourself in the foot and then reloading it and, you know, expecting it to go differently if you shoot yourself in the foot again. Um, yeah. You know, the idea is if a book fails, you cancel it, you wait a little bit. And when somebody has a new idea that you think might work, you know, then you try it again with new people. Yeah. And I think they don't want to, because the thing is, there are people who are, you know, uh, with legitimate concerns that are like these people, they're not, they're not fit to do this job. Right. So you mm -hmm. need to, they need to be fired. They need to be replaced. Something has to happen. Something has to happen. And um, well, I was I was talking with my wife about this for like fresh ideas. Yeah. And she was like, it's basically socialism. You do bare minimum, you fail. Hey, here's again. Try it again. You know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and they're not gonna they're not they don't want to change anything because it, well the thing is if they do, then it's like they lost because if they actually do fire people, then the, they would have to admit that they made a bad choice in the beginning. And if the SJWs are the ones that are making these decisions, they'll never do that because SJWs always double down. They always double down. And so they, they yeah, won't... They hate being wrong. <laughs> no, they hate being wrong. They, they don't want to make the change. So they'll actually let... They'll make the company go under in order to... to, yeah. to before they, they actually say, you know what? We did this wrong. We did this the wrong way. And, and that's why it has to be combated. So... But let, let me get into the other thing that's really important here. Um, okay. Aside from people's grievances with the way that, they're being, that, that Marvel's conducting itself in terms of its business practices and its storytelling and its product issues, the way that they are responding to criticism is the main reason why I, I brought this up. So they actually doxed. Did they successfully dox diversity in comics? Did they dox him? That whole situation was... Um, Susan Auger, who is, um, she's like a nobody. I'm not sure exactly, but I don't think she actually works in the industry. She was actually posting on Mark's Wade's, uh, post the other day and interacting with them. That's something to point out. She doxed his name 
and his previous employer and was trying to, uh, you know, get him fired. Yeah. Heather Antos tried to make him into a white supremacist because uh, he was at that Charlotte. What, what was it? Charlottesville. Is that what the yeah, city was? He was walking through Charlottesville when the uh, when the um, accident happened, when the accident happened. Yeah. He happened to be there at the time, but he wasn't involved with it at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he was going to but like buy. He bought a Black Panther book because there was the reprints going on. Yeah, he I was have actually that. going I to have, give one. I have that one. That's the Jack Kirby Black Panther book. You know, it's funny because the Black Panther book re- is currently um, it's being written by Tahishi Coates or something like that. Is oh that the God. guy? And it's like it's, this. It's this super SJW Black Lives Matter bullshit. But when I read the Jack Kirby reprint, I so showed good. and I showed it to my wife too, and she's like, "This book is awesome." It was like. Black Panther would deal with cosmic frogs and fucking interdimensional shit. And I was like, there is, there is nothing racial about this book at all. Mm-hmm. Not in you any, could, it was, you could put any, you could put any race, creed yeah, or any, anything, any but. character would have been in it. It would have been the same story, just fine. It would have been a great story either way. And that was actually, that's actually interesting because we, they, these people have regressed in their storytelling, but I digress <laughs> as they regress. Um, so yeah, they doxed him, and then they also the, after that happened, they uh, they planned on uh, coming after him at Comic Con. They wanted to goad him into punching them or taking mm-hmm. uh, attacking them so that they could hit him back. So well, the thing about the thing about B Clay Moore is uh, he's at current point uh, roughly like a year and a half or two years late on a Kickstarter, and I happen to have donated to said Kickstarter. So I told uh, Diversity in Comics this, and we often ridicule <laughs> we we often ridicule uh, B Clay more about this, and so I think some of that is bent up frustration about that. Um, yeah, I think you know because it has more writer. Well, you know, I wonder what's really going on. It seems all this the Mark Wade post and that thing got uncovered the same day. It just all seems really weird. What 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 thing got uncovered? You you were breaking up when you were telling us that. Oh okay. Um, the whole B Clay Moore and the secret Facebook group where they were talking about goading, you know, uh, diversity in comics into uh, violence or whatever, yeah. getting trying to get him to punch him. Uh, that happened the same day that Mark wade was doing the stuff that he said where he was going to you know come and get me so i can go talk to diversity it really seemed like um mark wade was trying to get like a group mob or something yeah. against diversity in comics tom brevert actually tweeted that out on fa- on twitter and it was just a look at like what are they doing what's the end goal and there's a whole thing about uh, these people always talk about diversity. Sometimes they talk about them. Sometimes they play this little game about us where they they say certain criticisms, you know, or whatever. This you know, passive aggressive shit. Us. Yeah, that's yeah. that's normal. It, I call it like I call it like creating the boogeyman because it makes you look like you know you're scared of like somebody on your bed <laughs> that isn't really yeah. there. Um, yeah. So. I think that they're, they they solely talk about diversity in comics because they want to destroy him and his character, and then they think everything will go away. When, oh, when in oh, reality, yeah. I'm. And by you know, extension, and there's a whole bunch of. Well, they don't. They want to destroy him, but also by extension, everyone who is similar to him. This is this is how they roll. This is what is normal. So, like, if if they can find something on diversity in comics or anybody for that matter, it just so happens that he's their target because his channel grew the fastest. Although there are people with um, larger channels that have made content like that, but the, but not as consistency and they haven't grown or consistently and they haven't grown as quickly. Like we've been doing it for, a, for a while. Like we've done, you know, we talked about the mockingbird book when it first came out, unstoppable wasp, unsolicited opinions on Israel, the female Thor, like way back when they first said they were going to do it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it didn't get the same attention because we also talk about lots of other stuff. So, and on top of that, and this is, I think that's even more, uh, important. DNC also offers very constructive, not that we don't, but he offers constructive criticisms and ways to improve things. 
not just uh, you know, it's not just shitting on people. I'm not, it's, it's also like, okay, here's how you fix it. This is what you need to do. I want to see this improve. And we feel the same way. We think that the, me, you know, the medium, the thing about comics is as a medium, and this is one of the things I've always admired about it. Effectively comics has no budget. It's like you can, it's like watching a movie with zero budget. So you can mm -hmm. do whatever the fuck you want and you can have it run forever. As long as it's, telling a good story and it has good artwork and i think that in mo most, many cases that is that is true i mean just look at japan for example in japan manga is a big part of their entire culture everyone reads it and they have something for every age group and people read it on the bus and on the trains in you know public transportation it is it is uh, a part a core part of the entire culture comics for us is very similar although not to the same scale this is why I think it is something worth protecting. So when I see that there are people who are ruining it because of the, the way that they're approaching it ideologically, and they're not um, even thinking about solutions. In fact, that people who offer solutions are demonized and they're shat on, and then they go after them. They try to expose them. They try to demonize them. They try to make them into a boogeyman. Then they try to uh, essentially throw anybody who is associated with them into the same basket to say, if you share views with this person, or if you talk to this person, or if you know this person and you don't hate them as much as we do, then you're just as bad as they are. This is the climate that they're creating. And it's extremely destructive. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel like it's just been you and me and Hannah and Mike haven't said anything. I don't know if they have, like, Hannah wants to say anything or whatever. But uh, you, you guys are doing your thing. I'm, I'm, I'm just sat back in awe at this point. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's like, I just so this is what I I wanted to uh, say in terms of like, well, okay, now I think this is what was happening. We have Comic Gate. It's definitely a thing. All right. Our enemies, at least in my opinion, this is basically what happens when you act as though the uh, the culture war that's happening in every interest. By the way, most of these interests, if not all of them, tend to be male dominated. And I don't think that's an accident. They're not. It's not an accident because that's what happened in gaming. And that's actually also happening in other uh, interest areas like uh, miniature gaming and uh, tabletop gaming, for example, also has this problem. Yeah, so, you don't see them coming in and going, we need to fix Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, and make no. it more manly or whatever. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, because by and large, the audience, uh, uh, the male audience has no interest or they like it as it is. They just say, oh, this is fine. You know, they just take it as it is. But it's the people who go into a hobby and they they either do so as professionals or as, you know, um, I guess participants themselves. And then they say, well, I like this, but I think I need this to change. Those are the ones that you want to be concerned with. You know, it, it, that doesn't mean that if something voluntarily happens or if they're adding to it, hey, that's fine. But if you want to take something and change it to suit your um, sensibilities and people take issue with that, you should expect that to happen. So in my opinion, when it comes to comics, the this is what would naturally have been the result of the culture war that started with Gamergate and has not ceased in areas that men take interest. This inevitably happens. Social justice warriors, feminists, um, social constructivists, uh, micromanagers, they get involved and they want to change it. And there's, and it didn't need fixing. Like comics are worse now than they ever were. And there's no reason for it because we have movies and television shows and all kinds of additional media that should be expanding this stuff. It should be creating more interest, but it's actually creating less interest. And it, it's, I want to point out one thing. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, that the that that invasion, that social justice invasion, and a lot of it is is feminist directed, but it is uh, it is reminiscent again of uh, of of the uh, laws during slavery. Uh, blacks were not allowed to gather without a white person present. And here we have this, this interest in ensuring that no group that is, is primarily male is allowed to gather or allowed to uh, communicate or allowed to share a common interest and, and have control over that common interest. 
without someone representing the interests of social justice and feminism present. They, they, they cannot leave this stuff alone. They have to come in and change everything specifically to suit the sensibilities of the snowflakes. And it, it strikes me that this is an effort to ensure that there is no place where the type of freedom of thought takes place and 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 particularly no place where uh where where merit is is king no place where um where you know where hard work and uh diligence get you anywhere and that it's it strikes me that this is an attack on that in particular uh, those aspects of masculinity that that are involved in actually getting things done uh, so that's just that's all I wanted to point out. It just it, it's another of the hallmarks of enslavement and domination that that uh, you know this is not allowed to just exist on its own merits with the the people that love it and have a passion for it being in control of it, but this 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 group of uh, authoritarian nannies has to come in and try to control everything. And that's a great point. Um, this isn't. In particular, women or anything, it's feminists. You know, I um, I just picked up the book that I, uh, I remembered I had. It's called. Um, it's from the comic book league defense fund, and it's she changed comics. It's printed I, by Image Comics, and it's the untold story of women who uh, changed free expression in comics. All you know, just showcasing all the women in comics. You know, and just flipping through it, you see Louise Simonson, who was a you know, writer and editor in the Bronze Age and Modern Age, Gail Simone, Fiona Staples, Jill Thompson, great cartoonist here. Um, you know, and the list goes on and on. There's like all the way to the to the Golden Age. You know, I, I say this all the time because of this book. Women have always been in comics. Gay people have always been in comics. I'm sure trans people have always been in comics. You know, it's never and they were all talented. There, yeah. there, there is like. I don't know that there. I would. I would argue that the kind of people who take an interest in things like comics and gaming are probably some of the most socially liberal people ever, because they're also they tend to be outcasts themselves. They tend to be okay. conclusive by their very nature, and comics has always been progressive in that way. You know, in the '60s, mm -hmm. uh, when Marvel was writing, you know, the X Men, for example, that that was what it was all about. It was about that. You know, they. they there was no, this isn't like a problem that needs fixing. This is people who feel like they are the, the um, uh, they're like the crusaders trying to make the world a better place. And they get a job in comics and they, they go in there trying to fix a problem that doesn't exist. And they're actually making problems. Like a big, um, a big female artist, you know, he drew all the women back in the day in the golden age. His name was Matt Baker. He was a black gay man. Like... <laughs> It's always been there, you know, it's always been there. And it's people that want to get the edge on people that don't have the skill over the pe other people that do. Well, you can't write Blade because you're a white guy. Right. Okay, you're not a vampire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How stupid is that? Uh, so, I don't know. That, the, the problem is, okay, so what, so what do we do? Um... First of all, Cap'n, is the is the hashtag Comicsgate a thing? Are people using it? I've pers uh, I do like a meme contest, which is pretty popular. I pick a subject every week that seems relevant with comics, and I personally um, use uh, make hashtag Make Mine Meme and uh, Make Marvel Great Again. I mean, that's the ones I've chosen. People can do whatever they want. Um, I don't know. And, and I haven't uh, seen comics going too often, though. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, I, I looked it yeah. up and I saw some stuff, but um, but we definitely, it doesn't really matter what we use. I mean, hashtags are handy because you can see, you know, like you can see how much growth it's gotten and stuff. But you should definitely mm -hmm. talk about this. If this is something that's interesting to you, it, it is to me as somebody who wants to get involved, as somebody who spends a good amount of money on comics, too. I mean, not lately, but I mean, I bought some some books, but I buy like the old stuff because I the stories are better. Um, then you should definitely I, talk I would, about I would this. Not buy, I would not buy new stuff unless no. I mean, maybe it's DC or Superman or something, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, lastly, I want to share <laughs> um, a, a, an illustration that I currently am displaying. Uh, it was made by I don't know who made this. Maybe, um, but it was a it's it is a, an image of a girl. I got it from from you uh, from one of your videos, Captain. But mm -hmm. and it says, "I am a comics fan. I am not against diversity, as it is always a part of my hobby." I am against poor writing and comics telling me how I should think instead of asking me to think. I relate to my heroes not because of their superficial traits, such as their gender, orientation, their race, etc., but by the ideals that they represent and the personality that they possess. I believe heroes are meant to be idealized both morally and physically to stand as an example of what I should strive for instead of patting me on the back for my insecurities. I believe writers should always respect the heroes whose stories they write, their legacy, and their established personalities and beliefs. I believe that true heroism is not being self-centered, but to want to better oneself, to have empathy, honor, strong morals, and ability to self-sacrifice. I believe there is a place for every type of story, but it's not fun for anyone to bastardize established characters. I believe in equality and promotion by merit. If you called me obnoxious or worse, you should not expect me to thank you for that. And I, I think a woman made this illustration, um, but there are definitely yes. women that that feel this way. So you know, if you guys are, and I hate playing the fucking identity politics card, but if you belong to these protected groups that these people supposedly stand up for, say something to them. Let them know, dude. It's... You don't. You don't. Uh, you don't. Speak for me. I speak for myself, and I think you guys should tell better stories. What's interesting is, um, if you look at my analytics, I have probably like five to ten percent women or whatever. Um, but those women are very vocal about what they think in the comment section. So uh, I, that's very interesting. Yeah, I, I want to point something out. Uh, identity politics is speaking in the name of whole demographics. And and uh, playing victim in the name of whole demographics, entire demographics. Uh, it, it's not identity politics to turn around and say, no, I'm part of that demographic. And no, you don't speak for me. Stop trying to describe my experience because it's not what you're saying. That's not identity politics. That is counter identity politics. And uh, that's what Not Your Shield was all about. It's what women against feminism, hashtag women against feminism was all about. These discussions, these two discussions had to take place because there were and are people who, uh, in the name of social justice, will talk over entire demographics and, and paint their victim narrative over entire demographics in a very exploitative manner. And they're basically whoring us out for victim points. And, and those victim points are used basically to buy political cred. And, and frankly, I'm not here to be somebody's political cred. I'm not here to, to, to provide someone else with victim points. And I don't think most women are. I don't think most minorities are. I think it's a very small percentage of every population that is out there doing exactly this thing. And it's really... It is, in terms of <clears throat> the intersectional progressive um, uh, end of, of the social justice ideology, uh, that they, they will actually become everything that they claim they're protecting you from when you uh, when you you buck their authority and you go off the reservation as as a, a protected class. Uh, and they'll deny that you are who you are. They'll deny that you're part of the demographics, you're part of, and, and everything. But what they can't do is silence the voices of the people who disagree with them. And it's, uh, it's an unfortunate thing that some people's voices carry more power and more volume in this discussion, specifically because of their demographic. But because these social justice types feel that they can exploit your demographic for their own purposes without your permission. It's, it's kind of a responsibility to use that power. You know, the, you know, the saying with great power comes great responsibility, right? So it's, it's <laughs> definitely a responsibility to use that power to get your 
actual experience, your actual beliefs, your actual opinions across. And don't let these people speak in your name. If you disagree with them, speak up. Because if you don't, they're telling everybody this is how you feel. This is what you want. And that's what's going to end up coming about because that's that's what's, what it's being sold under. So it is all of our responsibility to, to, to speak up and say, no, you don't speak for me. I disagree. Yeah. And, and do that if you can, wherever you are. And also vote with your dollars. Don't buy the book, the books that are shit. Just don't only get the stuff you like and promote the stuff and if that it's you good, like. If it's good, even if it's at Marvel, you know, if it's good, at least if you're buying that book, Marvel knows that that book's good, you know, then at least, yeah. you know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Buy the stuff that's good. So don't boycott the company, just boycott the products. And That you... reminded me of uh, something, you know, the whole thing where they make the argument that um, if you see yourself in the character, you automatically like it. Um, that's like their my wife... central thing. Yeah. So like uh my Captain Marvel has like shaped their character around my wife. You know, my wife has very short blonde hair. Um you know, she's a smaller petite woman, you know. And the whole thing about Captain Marvel was she had large breasts and and huge hips, you know. And <laughs> like I showed this to my wife and she's like, had... "Why are they doing this?" like I would never, I would never read comic books. She hates it, you know? And so it's funny that they're like really, you know, marketing these things towards, you know, people that want, my wife likes Lifetime, you know? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with Lifetime, but it's not my thing. It's hers. I wouldn't come in and want to say, well, we need to put Sylvester Stallone in this Lifetime mo movie. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the th that's just it, though. Like, Carl Manvers, if they would have just made a new character that looked like that, that's fine. But they just changed, they my, changed her my in, wife, a, I just in a fundamental way. My wife doesn't look like Carl Manvers, though. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> she, she's more womanly than that. Okay, you, well, you started it. I didn't want to assume, <laughs> hey, you know, it's, it's, you know, whatever you're into, I'm okay with that. That's your business. But anyway, um, so... I don't really have much else to add on to this. I just really need to get this off my chest. I saw what was happening. It ha it's not showing any signs of slowing down. Um, I care a lot about the comics industry. Allison does too. She she actually, um, I want to do a stream with all of the comic YouTubers again. Also maybe include Appa Ben this time. So uh, we'll, we'll try to work that out as soon as we can get the timing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get diversity and, um, and I'll bring Captain back and couple of other people and we'll try to see where you know what's going on try to like stay on top of things get organized and see what we can do to push back on this because right now they have the platform they have the largest megaphone they are um essentially they have they're in a position to craft the narrative and we have to get ahead of it because if they do then the normies are gonna see only half the story so we have to try to change that I, th I think what's one good thing, though, is their sales are already crashing. So I wonder what's, like, the end goal. Like, how long can this actually last? Uh, and I that's, that's the question. interesting point, you know. I mean, we're at, like, it, it's weird. I don't know. That's all I got. There may, no, there may be no turning back, but we'll see. But anyway, I'm going to take us out. Um, I want to thank Captain Cummings for coming as a guest. Thank you for coming on. And I'd like to also thank Hannah and Mike for joining us. Max couldn't make it today. Unfortunately, uh, he has to put his dog down, which makes me sad because I had to do that too. And I know what that's like. Sorry, Max. I hope everything's going to be all right. I want to thank you guys for coming on and joining us on this week's Polecat cast. We're going to be going on to the after show. Where we're going to be looking at this story. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's a story that claims to know what trolls really think. So we're going to be learning about tr what what uh, this website has to say about trolls and the truth about trolls. Well, we'll, we'll find out what that is uh, in the after show. So if you want to join us in the after show, please consider becoming a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash Honey Badger Radio. And uh, that will give you access to either watch the shows or even join in as a participant, depending on what you decide to give us. In the meantime, we're going to be taking off now. Thank you guys for joining us on this week's Polecat cast. And we will see you guys on the next 